I sat on a stool at my favorite bar after work, sipping the only beer I allowed myself while I waited for the bowling alley next door to open. At the other end of the bar sat a very beautiful, dark-haired woman trying to catch my eye. Finally, the bartender, Sam, put another beer in front of me, and I declined it. It's not on the house, Ted. It's from the lady at the end of the bar, he said. Thank her for me and give her the money back. You can put it on my tab, pour it out, or do whatever you want with it, I said. A few minutes later, the brunette came over and sat on the stool next to me. She had a pretty face and clear eyes. You probably shouldn't be sitting here, I said, and then took another sip of my beer. Not taking the beer I bought for you wasn't very nice, she said. Is there some reason you don't like me? I like you, but I don't know you. I have trust issues when it comes to women. Right now my life is uncomplicated, and I like it that way. If you stay at this bar long enough, another guy will show up and you can buy him a beer. He'll probably be prettier, younger, richer, better looking. What if I just like you? She asked. That's not going to happen, so why bother? I asked. You don't know anything about me, so how do you know we can't at least be friends? She asked in response. Let's see, I said, turning to look at her. You're between 25 and 30 years old. You're educated. You have a good job. You have a nice body and you want to show it off. But you're afraid to because you have a few small flaws you're obsessing over. You are either married and trying to cheat on your husband or recently divorced. You're conservative, but you like to think you're a little wild. And I paused and tilted my head slightly to the left before continuing. You're actually a lot wilder than you think. You just need someone to bring this girl to the surface. Her ex or current husband was or is much older than you, and I remind you of either him or someone else. How many did I guess? Almost all of them, she said. My husband died a little over a year ago. I stopped wearing my ring a week ago. Toward the end, there was no love left between us, but when he got sick, I still had to stay and care for him until the end, if only out of respect. And when he was gone, even though, as you said, I felt like he was holding me back, I just couldn't bring myself to look for someone else so soon after his death. But when I saw you, you reminded me so much of my first boyfriend, the one I left to marry my ex. Now I'm back at work and I'm in a business I think I'm going to like, but I'm not too sure about it at the moment. What about you? She asked. You look young enough to decide to be alone for the rest of your life. And don't you have needs? I thought all men had, you know, wants. And when I look at you, I don't see the tough jerk you're trying to appear to be, she said. I see a sincere romantic. I think you've been hurt, and you're trying to build a wall around yourself. But it's not to shut people out as you think. I think it's to keep you from getting hurt again. So what made you act like this? I raised my beer so the bartender could see it. Play it again, Sam. And maybe you better get the lady another one. Sam brought us fresh drinks and I began my story. You may be right about romance, but that's not what I'd like to mean. I don't consider myself a romantic. Rather, I see myself as a simpleton because I really got caught up in it. I was happily married to the girl of my dreams about a year ago, but that dream turned into a nightmare on national television, so almost everyone knows what a fool I was. I met Ellie about six years ago at a party, and it was just love at first sight. I know some people don't believe that, but when I saw her, I became a believer. One minute I didn't know her from Adam, and the next minute nothing in my life mattered but her. To me she was the most beautiful girl in the world, but really probably about six. She has fiery red hair and beautiful green eyes. Her eyes look like cat eyes, and they are so expressive that I could always tell by their expression what mood she was in and what the hell she was thinking. Damn, I love this woman. A year after we met, we were married. I worked as an engineer for a large manufacturing company. We made suspension parts and steering knuckles for several major automakers. Ellie worked part-time as a waitress and became a homemaker when we got married. We planned to live together and enjoy life for a while before having children. This was due to her sister and brother-in-law getting married because he knocked her up and their lives were going to hell. They were constantly fighting about everything and we just wanted to be smarter. Ellie's sister and brother-in-law and a few cousins and sisters-in-law scattered here and there was her whole family. They lived in a trailer park about five miles from us. She actually lived with them until we were married. I think they were glad we got married because not only could they come over and use our pool whenever they wanted, 
but they got more room in the trailer since Ellie moved out. Ellie and her sister Sally were inseparable, and whenever I couldn't find her, all I had to do was call Sally or walk into the trailer and she was there. Most evenings when I got home from work, Allie, Sally, and Sally's husband Billy would gather in my living room. Ally and Sally were connoisseurs of the great American art form, daytime trash television. They lived and died by Jerry Springer, Judge Judy, The People's Court, and of course, The Maury Show. I never had a taste for that type of entertainment, since I was burdened with work and everything else. But I was glad Ellie had something she liked that kept her from being lonely when we were apart. She usually had dinner ready by the time I arrived, and after dinner we would just make ourselves comfortable and do things together. We both loved seeing new things and discovering new things as we explored the countryside. Ellie just loved to admire the scenery, and I loved to drive anywhere and for any occasion in my Arctic White 2008 Mustang GTCS Vert. For those who don't know, it's a California Special GT convertible. In fact, this car and Ellie went toe-to-toe -to -toe in the war for my love, so having them both on the road together was a dream come true for me. The car had a cherry bomb exhaust system, which, although it violated California emission standards, sounded great. It also had cross-drilled and slotted rotors, the brake calipers were painted arctic white to match the body, and all the glass and headlights were tinted. I love that car to this day. If it wasn't for Sally, none of this would have happened. I have nothing against Sally. She is an attractive woman in her own right, and she has the most genuine heart of anyone I know. She looks like Ellie, only a few years older, a little taller and a little fatter. Sally is also blonde. Sally has hit on me a couple times, and until it all blew up, I really thought she was doing it as a test. To see if I'd cheat on her sister if the opportunity presented itself. Of course, I turned her down both times and life got better. That was about a year ago, when Sally and Billy started fighting a lot more often than usual. They weren't the usual fights where they yell at each other and then kiss and make up. These fights began to last longer and longer and spill over to those around them. Finally, Sally decided to go to the highest and most respected agency she could think of. I thought they would go to a marriage counselor, but of course I was wrong. Sally contacted Maury's show and was booked to appear on an episode about cheaters. Sally arranged for Billy to take a lie detector test on national television to find out if he was cheating on her. She also suspected that he had cheated with several women and had gotten one of the girls at the trailer park pregnant. Of course, Billy claimed he was completely innocent, and Sally was just upset because she was in her 30s and wanted to hold on to him. The girl she suspected of cheating on Billy was also going on the trip. She lived in the same trailer park and was only 19 years old. It all seemed like a circus to me, and I laughed looking at the whole situation. I was pretty sure Billy was guilty, but kept it to myself. I was also glad that Allie and I were nowhere near having this kind of difficulty. I wished them well and promised to record the show on the DVR so we could all watch it sometime in the future. That evening, Ellie let the boom down on me. She wanted to go to Connecticut to film the show, too. Not only did she want to, but she felt she needed to go there. Just in case Billy cheated or was involved in something bad, Sally would need someone's support. Of course, for Allie, it was the chance of a lifetime to see her favorite show being filmed and recorded. It was a dream vacation for her. But since she wasn't involved in the case or the episode, the network wouldn't pay for her flight or hotel room, but I assured her that we'd have no problem sending her. That's when I learned that she was counting on me to take a few days of vacation and go as well. There was no way she would leave me home alone while she herself flew off to another state. She said she trusted me, of course, but she didn't need me to be tempted to hit the clubs and go to loose women while she was away. She was sure that too much free time was what got Billy in trouble. I suggested that perhaps Billy needed a job, but she only laughed. Besides, she reminded me that in our five years of marriage, we had never gone without fun unless one of us was sick or injured, and she wasn't about to start doing that now. So a few days later, we all flew to Stamford, Connecticut to shoot the show. We were met at the airport by an assistant director on the show's staff. Ellie and I went straight to the hotel, while the show staff went to a production meeting to outline what they needed to do for filming the next day. As soon as we were in the room, Ellie jumped up on the bed, pretending not to look at me. I could feel her eyes drilling my back as I unpacked our suitcases. Isn't that what a woman is supposed to do? I asked. I'll show you what a woman is supposed to do, she smirked. Suddenly, Sally walked in without knocking. What are you even doing here? Aren't you supposed to be in the studio? said Allie. They need Billy more than they need me. He has to take a lie detector test. 
They only needed to ask me a few questions and record one little snippet about what I think he's doing. They needed more from that whore than they needed from me, she said. Do you think Billy is really cheating on me? Allie didn't answer, only squeezed my hand tighter. I think she and I knew the answer to that question. Judging from Allie's unspoken reaction, I was sure she thought Billy was probably cheating on her sister. Honey, I can't answer whether or not your man is cheating on you, but we're sisters. We'll help each other out in times of need. If he's cheating on you and you decide to throw his cheating to the curb, I'll be at your side if you need anything. If you and the kids need to stay with Ted and me for a while, we'll have plenty of room. Ellie, you are very lucky to have a man who loves you the way Ted does. I can't imagine him ever cheating on you. Can I tell you a secret? She said quietly. I already know, Ellie replied. You've tested him a couple times. You love Billy too much to cheat on him. And if he cheated, would you take him back? Maybe in time, but he'd have to make some changes in our lives. He'd have to agree to never cheat on me again, and if he does, we'll break up. And he needs to at least try to get a damn job. We've lived in this damn trailer too long, and we have too many kids to squeeze into it. It's just not fair to the kids to make them live like this. But we've been together so long, I don't think I'd know how to live without him. No one's perfect. Men make mistakes from time to time, so I don't see the point in ruining our whole marriage over this, but he has to change. Ellie squeezed my hand gently again and began to purr softly. You really love her, don't you? She asked. I nodded my head and smiled. You guys aren't like Billy and me. Sometimes I think we're only together because we've been together so long that we don't know how to do anything else. But you really freaking love my skinny sister. I had no idea. She got up and went to her room. I'm glad she's finally gone, Ellie whispered, pulling a blanket over herself. And by the way, I love the hell out of you too. Till death do us part. The next morning we all had breakfast together before the shoot. I noticed two things right away. First, Sally had gotten her hair and makeup done. She looked amazing, or at least amazing for Sally. Billy, on the other hand, looked like he hadn't slept that night. He looked at Sally as if he was truly afraid of losing her. Marilyn, the supposed other woman he slept with, was not driving with us, but being only 19 years old, we didn't think she would want to. We all got into the limo that had been sent. Billy, Sally, and Marilyn went one way, and Allie and I went the other when we got to the studio. The production facility was a large warehouse-like building with the sets from the TV show in the center. Around it were screening rooms, conference rooms, dressing rooms, and other areas. Around the set, of course, were cameras and all sorts of guys running around with headsets and setting up God knows what. In the back was a recording booth where technicians controlled camera angles and sound recording levels. Producers, directors, cameramen, and security people were constantly going in and out of this madness. When you watch the show, it seems like each segment only takes a few minutes. I saw the show several times when I was homesick or on vacation. I really thought we could come here for filming and be back at the hotel in an hour or two. We were there for three hours before they started filming our segment. Sally was the middle one of the three segments of the show they were filming that day. The first was a teenage mother who claimed that her neighbor's husband got her pregnant. He was a Protestant minister and claimed that as a man of God, he would never commit the sin of adultery. He and his wife vented all their rage on the teenage mother. They claimed that she was a woman of ill repute and her word meant nothing against the word of a good Christian minister and his godly wife. The preacher failed a lie detector test and DNA proved that he was the father of the child. The preacher's wife attacked him and the girl on stage and they had to be subdued. The best part of this segment was how Maury, who is really taller than you think, announced it. The minister, whose wife was already mad at him for failing a lie detector test, looked nervous. He seemed to be silently asking God to change the results of the DNA test. He tried to take his wife's hand, but she wouldn't budge. He realized that if the child was proven to be his, both his marriage and his career would be over. His wife was very agitated and, narrowing her eyes, looked at both her husband and the girl. The girl, on the other hand, sat relaxed in her chair as if she didn't care at all. It was as if she knew what she had done was wrong, but she was calm because the truth had come to light, and also because she would have proof of paternity and the legal right to collect child support, and that would make her life a little less hellish. In the blinding glare of the studio lights, the whole room fell into silence as Maury spoke. In the case of 10-month-old Amber Marie, he then paused spectacularly and stretched out the moment before continuing. 
Reverend Pritchard, you're a father. The former man of God immediately jumped up and ran out of the auditorium to the backstage, and his wife followed him, screaming for divorce from his cheating husband. On stage, the mother of his favorite child jumped to her feet and began to perform her victory dance on stage, which was so seductive it would have made a stripper blush. The audience loved it, and I even found myself getting involved. Ellie poked me in the ribs with her elbow and said, There was no need to ogle that little slut when I already have someone who can dance for me better than I can alone. Sally then came out and sat down in one of the chairs on the set. She struck up a conversation with Maury. She told him how she and Billy had been together for seven years and had five children. She talked about how they lived in a trailer and how he never had a job, but she loved him anyway. Naturally, the audience cheered her for supporting her man no matter what situation they were in. She then started talking about how their life had gone downhill lately and rumors had reached her that Randy had been cheating on her and may have even gotten her pregnant by one of the other women in the trailer park. The audience booed and frowned, although no one encouraged them to do so. The monitor then showed Billy in his taped interview. Billy said, He had always been loyal to Sally and it upset him that she even thought he might cheat on her. Sally and their children were his life, and if she had made him take a lie detector test, it would have meant she didn't trust him, and he would have seriously considered ending their marriage. The audience booed him, but Sally looked a little unsure. I knew she loved Billy and wanted him back no matter what. She wanted to check his behavior and let him know she wasn't stupid, but the thought of divorcing him was never on the menu. Next to me, Allie started talking about how that cheating bastard deserved everything he was going to get if he got that slut pregnant. She squeezed my hand and went backstage to comfort Sally while the technicians brought out a chair for Marilyn. Then Marilyn came on stage. The audience booed her as much as they booed Billy's tape. She sat down and immediately began talking about how Billy had entertained not only her, but several women in the trailer park. She wasn't in love with Billy, but she also wanted him to find a job and start paying child support to help care for his last child. She said she was sorry for what Sally had done, but Billy told her that he and Sally were going to divorce anyway. She claimed that she was 2,000% sure that Billy was the father of her child. I was confused because outside of trailer parks, you can only be 100% sure. 100% is all there is. Marilyn's statement, of course, made Sally cry, and Maury had to comfort her. To my surprise, Allie ran out on stage, hugged her sister, and tried to comfort her. That cheating bastard is no good, Ellie said. I knew we would have to videotape the episode when it aired because it was Ellie's dream come true. She was actually on Maury's show. We'll probably have to watch it every day for the rest of our lives. Then they finally brought Billy out. I felt sorry for him as he walked down the ramp onto the set. It took a lot of courage to walk through a crowd of people who so clearly hated him, having never known him or spoken to him. There was not one kind face for Billy among the spectators. Even Marilyn, who was no less guilty, received far more support, or at least less venom, than poor Billy. Maury started asking Billy questions, and Billy denied everything. He denied that he had ever cheated on Sally. He denied ever doing it. He denied that he didn't have a job. He claimed he was just unemployed. I expected him to deny that his name was Billy. He stated that he didn't know Marilyn personally, but he had heard about her from friends and she was a whore. He said she was like free internet service. She jumped up and ran across the stage, hissing and swinging at him. Sally, for some reason, rushed to save Billy. Allie, of course, rushed to her sister's aid, and the security guards had to separate them all. With everyone erupting and the show becoming more about Jerry Springer than Maury, it was time for Maury to announce the results of the DNA test. In the case of three-month-old Stephen, Maury began, Billy, you're not the father. Marilyn jumped into the air, crying and screaming that the test was wrong, and ran off the stage. This time, Billy breathed a sigh of relief and started dancing on stage. We have yet to announce the results of the lie detector test, Maury said. The audience, still hungry for dirt or blood, fell silent again. We asked Billy if he ever had a thing with Marilyn, Maury said. Billy answered that he hadn't. Our lie detector test showed it was a lie, and he had done it more than ten times. Billy began to argue that the test was wrong. Sally jumped up and punched him in the face with such force that the sound echoed throughout the studio. Allie pulled her back to her seat. We asked Billy if he'd ever had sex with any woman outside of his marriage other than Marilyn, Maury said. 
He answered that he hadn't. Our lie detector test showed it was a lie that he had more than five other women and more than 50 times. Sally was crying so hard that Allie had to support her. Billy dropped his head to his knees and begged Maury to stop reading out the results. The audience screamed, demanding a continuation, but Maury, despite seeming to care about Sally, just kept reading question after question. Each new revelation seemed to throw both Billy and Sally further out of whack, but Maury continued to read out the rest of the results. I felt sorry for Billy and Sally, but I couldn't resist the urge to laugh because this whole situation was just unreal. Sally suddenly jumped up and started yelling at Billy. The fury in her eyes made Maury jump out of her way. You goddamn bastard, she screamed. I knew it had been cut out so the audience wouldn't hear it, but I knew exactly what she'd said. Who were they? I want to know who those whores were that were worth more to you than your own children because I'm done with you, Sally shouted angrily. Yeah, you sick bastard, Ellie shouted. You don't need to talk, Allie, Billy said and my world began to close in on me because I knew what he was going to say before he even said it. And like rain after the first roll of thunder on a sunny day, the words came out. Billy looked at my wife and said, Since we both know you were one of those whores. The room was suddenly quiet and you could hear a pin drop. The cameras turned back and forth to Ellie and Sally to see her reaction. Ellie screamed no in slow motion and looked at me across the room, but I knew from the look in her eyes that it was true. If you don't believe me, ask your man on a lie detector, Billy said. He asked me if I've slept with anyone in your family. Sally turned to Allie and started hitting her. Allie was too busy looking for me to try to defend herself. But it was too late. Unnoticed, I slowly walked out of the studio. I walked out of the building and caught a cab to get back to the hotel. Back at the studio, Maury's team quickly canceled the next segment to give more time to the triangle of Sally, Allie, and Billy. I later learned that Allie repeatedly asked about me and where I was and was told I was backstage chilling. I truly believe they lied to her to keep her there and keep her from doing something stupid. They called my cell phone and hotel repeatedly. I just didn't answer. They wanted me to go back to the studio and put the wreckage of my marriage on TV. I checked out of the hotel an hour later and headed to the airport. Although I wasn't scheduled to fly home until two days later to have time to edit the piece and do possible reshoots, I was able to change my flight and leave 90 minutes later. Back in the studio, Maury's team of producers and consultants convinced Ally, Sally, and Billy to go back on stage. The audience was thrilled, their attention riveted to the stage. Sally told Ally and Billy that she never wanted to see either of them again. Billy apologized to her and swore that he would never touch another woman again in his life. He needed help because, like Tiger Woods, he was addicted to doing it. A counselor from Maury State volunteered to find him a therapy group for addicts in our area and they convinced Ellie that for the good of their children, who needed a father, she should give him another chance. It took a few days, but they also got Sally to forgive Ellie, who was miserable. Of course, I didn't find out until a week later, and frankly, I didn't care. As soon as I got home, I called a lawyer and started divorce proceedings. It wasn't easy, and I cried a lot, but I did it. Luckily, we live in a no-fault state, so there was no need to prove anything. However, if necessary, I had a show tape that would serve as excellent proof of both her infidelity and my subsequent humiliation on national television. Because I wanted the divorce to be quick, I agreed to a 50-50th split of all our assets, right down the middle. The only deviation was that she got the house and waived any rights to my future earnings or retirement package. Everything was supposed to go smoothly. I had my attorney call a bailiff to serve her divorce papers at the airport. Out of the same weird, morbid curiosity that makes people gawk at car crashes, motorcyclists, and NASCAR, I made sure to watch from afar as she was served the papers. My attorney was standing next to me, and we were both shocked as my formerly reserved, under 100-pound ex-wife ripped the papers to shreds and started trying to kick the document server's ass. She just lost her temper and they had to call security. The lawyer and I slipped out of the airport and went back to his office for a meeting. That bitch is crazy, he told me. Maybe I'd better get you a personal protection order or a restraining order. Don't worry about it, I said. I've temporarily moved into a hotel and I'm looking for a new house or apartment in another suburb. Yeah, but you're still working at the same place. And driving that almost neon white Mustang. You won't be hard to find, he said, shaking his head. So I took a couple of weeks off, but there was no way I was going to give up the car. 
I used that time to find a new house. It wasn't as nice as the old one, but I had too many memories of Ellie in that house to ever go back there. When I got back to work, Ellie was already standing in the parking lot waiting for me. Ted, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me, she said. You have to come home. I don't think I can live without you. I walked past her. Ted, at least talk to me. I swear this will never happen again. I love you. I always have. I don't care about Billy, she cried. He's not worth a damn to me. Suddenly, I couldn't take it anymore. I turned and pounced on her. Don't say that because you know it's not true. Billy must be worth a hell of a lot to you because he's worth more than me. All my love for you, our marriage, our life together, the children we could have, and our future. So maybe you should go back and entertain him a few more times to get full payback for what you gave up. Don't come back here again, Ellie. I don't want to see you again. If you have anything you want to say to me, pass it on through my lawyer. Ted, Sally has forgiven Billy. Remember when you and she were talking in our hotel room and you thought I was asleep? She told you then that she and Billy didn't love each other as much as we do. If she can forgive him, and he has cheated on her many more times and with many more people than I have to you, why can't you forgive me this time? I swear to you that this will never happen again. I'll get on my knees and beg you right now if I have to. You can't just throw away five years of happiness like that. Okay, Allie, I said. Get on your knees. She bent over in front of me and people started watching us. Please take me back, Ted. Don't divorce me. I love you, she said. No, I said and went into the building. That night I stayed and worked a little longer than usual. Walking out of the building, I was still wary. As I approached my Mustang, I noticed an old pickup truck parked right beside it. I looked around for Ellie and saw Sally sitting in the pickup. Ted, I know she hurt you a lot, she began. No one knows how much it hurts more than me. Billy's done it to me more than once. And I swear he knows this time will be the last time I take him back. My children will be better off without a father than with one who cheats and has other children with other women in our neighborhood. Especially with someone who can't get a job anywhere or anything. But as much as it hurt me, I still accepted him back because in my own way I know he loves me. It may not be as strong and fabulous as you and your sister, but love in any shape or form is so rare that it has value. He may not be the best man in town or even in my trailer park, but he's mine. When I think of all the others who are left alone, who would die to have someone in their lives, it makes me feel a little better to forgive him again. People aren't perfect, Ted. We're all prone to lapses in judgment, mistakes, and just plain brainless slip-ups. But when you truly love someone, you have to let go of those human flaws from time to time. Less than a month ago, I was sure you were willing to sell your soul for my little sister, but I find it hard to believe you've let it all go so quickly. What about all the time you both put into this marriage? Has it all been wasted? How about for better or worse until death do us part? I don't want to take up all your time, but there are three other things I'd like you to think about. First, this girl loves you like there's no tomorrow, and she's in a lot of pain right now. She knows she messed up, and it's going to take time for you both to get back on track, but she wants that more than anything. Because whether you know it or not, you are her world. Secondly, it's not like she's really having an affair. This is Billy we're talking about. She's not trying to replace you or fall in love with someone else. She doesn't love Billy. It was just as entertainment. Just something to do while you weren't around her and it meant nothing to either of them. Hell, I had to forgive them both. You only have to forgive Ellie. One last thing I want to say. Whatever you decide to do, please just talk to her. She knows she hurt you and it's killing her. This girl thinks the sun rises and sets around you and she hurt you. It may not even mean anything to you, but at least give her a chance to apologize. And to tell you the truth, Ted, I think it would do you some good yourself, because you don't look happy either. Then she hugged me, got back in her truck, and drove off. That night I thought about everything that had happened in my life since I met Ellie. I thought about how much I loved her and how happy we were until I found out about what she was doing. I was really happy. I realized that I still didn't know how or why she did what she did. If I had no intention of going back to her, those things didn't matter. But if there was even a tiny chance that we could save our marriage, these things became important. The next morning I called Sally. Billy picked up the phone, and as soon as I heard his voice, I hung up. Not two minutes later, my phone rang. Honey, did you call to talk to me? Ellie asked excitedly. Well, I began I. 
Yes, she snapped back, interrupting me. Yes to what? I asked. Whatever it takes to get us back together, I'll do it, she said. I know I screwed up big time and I swear I'll never do it again. But I'll do or say whatever it takes if it makes you give me another chance. I was going to say I want to talk to Sally, I said. Oh, she replied. Her mood clearly soured when she found out I wasn't calling to talk to her. Ted, have I ever told you that I'm sorry? Or that I miss you so much I can't stand it? Do you know that I feel empty, like there's just a hole inside me, she said quietly. I'm sure Billy will find something to fill it with, I said coldly. Look, I really didn't call to talk to you. Why aren't you at your house? Can I just talk to Sally? Sally's not here. She had to go to school to talk to one of the kids' teachers. And when you say my home, if you mean our home, it just isn't home without you. I can't bear to be there and feel like you have to be there with me. Why do you even need to talk to my sister? Maybe I don't need to anymore. Ellie, I really wanted to talk to her about what she said last night. It suddenly dawned on me that I don't know why you were having fun with Billy or if there was anyone else. I also wanted to ask her how she manages to forgive that worthless asshole time after time because I kind of wanted to think about talking to you again. But if you were really upset about what you did, you wouldn't be alone in that house with that asshole right now, would you? There's no hope for us, Ellie. I can see that now. Just sign the papers and let's move on. There was a hard click, followed by Ellie screaming and crying, and I just hung up. Sally called me about an hour later. Her voice was very strained, and I could tell she was angry. Ted, why did you call her just to torment her? She asked. I know she hurt you. But I thought you were the most mature person here. She's even worse now than she was before you talked to her. I had to give her something to help her sleep. Sally, I didn't call her. I called to talk to you. Billy picked up the phone and I hung it up. Allie called me back a couple minutes later and I told her I only wanted to talk to you. I wasn't ready to talk to her yet, but until she spoke, I started to think that maybe we had a chance. I spoke in a slow and even tone, hoping to calm Sally down. Sally, what time do you have to pick the kids up from school? I asked. 3.30, she replied. Why? I want to talk to you about all of this. So put on a pretty dress and let's go to lunch. You're still my sister-in-law for now, right? I asked. I don't have a pretty dress, she replied sadly. Okay, then we'll just meet at the mall, I said. North entrance, 40 minutes and get your makeup done, like for Maury's show. When Sally showed up at the mall, she looked gorgeous. Her lips were just a hint of a darker shade than their natural pink color. Her eyes were lined, but very subtly. Even the foundation she used was so light that you could see the freckles she and her sister had through it. Her long blonde hair was swept back and looked very elegant. I almost wished I had fallen for her instead of Ellie. But her clothes didn't match her makeup and hair. Why do you want me to put on makeup like a whore just so we can have lunch at the mall? She asked. We're not having lunch at the mall, I said. We're just meeting here. I took her hand and led her into a women's dress store. I made her try on three or four dresses. The third, a floral print, gray with a black pattern, was the one I had hoped for. The dress fit her figure and hid the changes the birth of five children had made on her. Ted, I thought we were supposed to talk about my sister, not play dress up, Sally said. We'll take it all, I said, handing the woman my card. And she'll wear it. We'll talk about you and me, sister, I told Sally. But I want us to have lunch at a nice restaurant and relax. There are some things I just have to ask you about. The place I chose was right around the corner from the mall. It was a great steak place. It was also Ellie's favorite restaurant. I made our reservations and placed our order. Sally was looking around and people were looking at her. I don't think she realized how beautiful she was. She deserved it and I was just happy I could give her one day free from everything she had to go through on a daily basis. Sally, you've been talking to both of them for the last three weeks. I know it hasn't been easy for you. How did you find the strength to not only forgive them both, but to put it all behind you and move on? I asked. I love your sister. I've loved her since the first day I met her. Sometimes I feel like my heart beats just for her. But at the same time, I'm furious with her. I can't bring myself to talk to her. Every time I talk to her, I get so angry that I just want to explode. 
One minute I'm thinking about how great it would be to hug her again, and the next minute I'm thinking about wrapping my fingers around her throat. I know you love Billy, but I can never be in the same room with him again without killing him. Even if somehow, and that's a very big if, Ellie and I manage to save our marriage, things have to be different. No more Christmas and holidays together, no more backyard barbecues or your visits to swim and socialize. You and the kids are always welcome, of course, but Billy can never set foot in my house again, and I won't come to yours unless you kick him out. That goes without saying, but I just can't find the strength that you have no matter how much I love her. Something inside me doesn't want to forgive that. I was hoping you found out from them how it all started, when and with how many people she cheated on me. And why, I guess. That would be good to know, too. And then, like I said, I really want to know how the hell do you manage to ignore what that asshole does to you and keep living. Sally took another bite of steak and looked down at her plate. She pretended not to notice the tears on my face, and I pretended not to notice hers. Ted, I'm not as strong as you think I am at all. It really hurts me every time he does that, she said. When we went on the show, I already knew I was going to get him back. I was ready to be mad if he got that girl pregnant, but I was still going to take him back. I was ready for him to screw around with me with a few different women, but I swear to you, I had no idea that Ellie was one of them. That hurt me a lot. I was even more pissed off at Billy and really pissed off at Allie. But as for Billy, I still wanted him back. She set aside her knife and fork and leaned toward me. Ted, my mom died when Ellie and I were seven and nine years old. Our dad cheated on her for more years than I can remember. At nine years old, it seemed like a common question I should ask my mom before she died. I would ask her, Mom, where's dad? And she would just be sad and say he was with another woman and other kids. When she died, Ellie and I kind of raised ourselves. We learned a lot from our own experiences, learning what we should and shouldn't do, but we learned. I guess I'm kind of like my mom in some ways. I don't like the way Billy is, but I hope he will change or mature as he gets older. He's not a bad or abusive person. He has never hit me or the kids, even in anger. But he just can't keep his Johnson on a leash. I guess there are times when I look at my kids and wish they had a daddy who could go to work and bring money home. Or wish we had a nice house and all that. But when I look at these kids, I see his smile in each of them. He is a part of each of my children, so I don't see how I can throw him away. I promise to love him for better as well as for worse, so I have to take the bad with the good. As for Ellie, there are still a couple times a day I just want to reach out and beat the crap out of her. I ask myself how she could do that to me. I would never do that to her. Even when I was fooling around with you, trying to see if you'd go for it. I knew you'd never do it. You love Ellie too much. And Ted, whether you know it or not, that's why this is so hard for you. It's because you love her so much. If you didn't love her, we wouldn't be having this conversation. You'd just get a divorce and try to do it in a way that didn't leave her with one damn dime. Right now, all of this is still raw and fresh and you are still in a lot of pain. The anger you are feeling is taking precedence over love. It will take some time for things to balance out and then we'll know how things will resolve. If anger takes over, you probably won't take her back and that could destroy my sister or send her to the other side of the world. But if love wins, it will be even harder because you will want her back and your pride is already hurt so it won't be easy and it will be hard. But I do believe that those people I saw in the hotel room three weeks ago will not let what they had die. I reached across the table and took Sally's hand and kissed it. We left the restaurant, and I couldn't resist furtively glancing at Sally's long legs stretched out in the front seat of my Mustang. I dropped her off near her car in time for her to pick up her kids. I felt bad about what I was doing to Sally, but I had to know. I found out later that she made quite a mess at her kids' school and especially when she went back to the trailer park. As soon as she walked in, Allie jumped up and asked where she had been. Billy couldn't take his eyes off her and started to get angry too. You can both relax, Sally said. I went to lunch with my brother-in-law. Where did you get those clothes? Billy asked. Ted bought me an outfit so we could go to a nice restaurant, replied Sally. It was great. I had the best time of my life. Ted should have taken you to a cheaper place and brought enough food for everyone, snapped Billy. What kind of friend is he? Why would he want to be your friend? Sally snapped back. Ted's been good to us since the day he started dating my sister. He's always given us money for this and that, taken us to different places. I love you, Billy, but how have you repaid him? 
You repaid his generosity by ruining the one thing he valued more than anything else in the world, his marriage. I suppose you think that since our marriage didn't mean much to you, Ellie didn't matter to him either. Now, my husband, he's in a lot of pain right now. He's trying to be firm and hold it together, but he's not the same and probably never will be. Even if he takes my sister back, it will never be the same here again. So if I were you, I wouldn't plan on showing up at the house to swim or on Sundays to watch soccer on that huge flat screen TV. He's done with you. Jesus, woman, you act like I've done something crazy, Billy said. All I did was entertain Ally. Everybody does A things with Ally, even Ted. So why shouldn't I take the opportunity? Besides, there's nothing special about her worth getting upset about. A man has to try different flavors from time to time. I know I've had too much and I told you I intend to cut back, but he's going too far. Billy, Sally said. Ted isn't trying. He really loves Ellie and doesn't want to share her with anyone else. He really, or maybe he did, sees something special in her. And that's what I wanted for my little sister. I wanted her to have something that neither I nor my mom had. A man who puts her first. And it's not just your fault. I'm really mad at Ellie too. Because as much as I love you, the three of you wouldn't be half as good as Ted. And my sister probably just messed up her life because she couldn't keep her legs shut. What are you talking about, Sally? Ellie shrieked. Allie, I know you love Ted, but honey, he's not like us. I know you think he's going to stomp around and drag you through the mud for a couple weeks, but it's been almost a month. It's time you realize that you may not have him back. He really, and I mean really, loved you and when you got together, but he expected you to be faithful to him when you got married. Was the sex with him bad? Sally asked. He was wonderful, replied Allie. I miss him so much I can't stand it. You have to help me, Sally. He won't even talk to me. If things were so good, why the hell were you having fun with Billy? Sally asked. Because she's a slut, snapped Billy. She just wanted to deny me the opportunity to watch soccer on that big-ass TV. And a dumb slut at that. It was obvious that Billy was enjoying the role of bully. All a guy has to do is just walk up to her. Next thing you know, they'll already be doing it. It can be any guy. Fat or thin, short or tall, the main thing is over 18. And if Ted is so damn smart with his job and all that shit, why doesn't he know he married a whore? Maybe someone should tell him. If she loves him so much, why won't she stop? I guess I'll have to tell him so he knows what's really been going on all these years. It's not Christian to let a man be so in the dark. Does Ellie know that you had fun with the preacher at your wedding or with his boss? If you tell him any of that shit, I'll kill you in your sleep, Billy, Sally snarled. I'm not going to let you ruin my little sister's life any more than you already have. And you, Allie, get the hell out of that trailer. Drive the car your man bought for you to that nice house he bought for you and wait for him to take you back. I'll try to talk to him for you, but that's all I can do. I bet she's having fun with him, Allie, Billy snapped back. I bet that's why he bought her all those damn clothes. I bet they've been having fun since you met him. Now that he knows about us, he's decided to trade your skinny ass for a real woman. Maybe that's why when he calls, he doesn't want to talk to you, his goddamn wife, or me, his brother-in-law and friend. He only wants to talk to Sally. Sally, then, Billy smirked. Does he only want you or my kids, too? Are those kids even mine? It's funny as hell that you dragged me to Maury's show and showed our dirty laundry on national television, only to have us come home and find out that you're as big a phony as I am and a whore like your sister. And here I thought I was marrying a good man. Maybe I'll call old Ted and see how much I can get from him if I agree to trade you for this pillow. I heard Sally walk quickly across the room. The sound of her new heels on the trailer floor was unmistakable. Yelled to Sally, Billy, I love you, but you're an idiot. I never cheated on you with anyone, not even Ted. And Ted loved Allie so much, he practically cried for her as much as she cried for him. You know he wanted to take me out to dinner to find out? I'll tell you. Ellie, you already know that your husband has a lot of pride. He can't just take you back even though he wants to. He has to have a reason or an understanding of why you did what you did. When you married him, you both promised a lot of things, and you broke one of the most serious promises. He just doesn't look at entertainment the way you and Billy do. To him, it's not just something to do when you're bored. He sees it as a bond between two people who love each other. And if one of them does it with someone else, it breaks that bond. 
The funny thing is that it shows how wrong opinions about people can be. I love you more than anyone in the world, Ellie, including this asshole, and I know you've always thought you were deprived. That's why you started having fun with every guy who looked at you, to prove something. But I was always jealous of you because I thought maybe you had brains. You just heard what your son-in-law thinks of you, and what he thinks of me, and Ted. The man who made you practically throw away your marriage thinks of you as a whore that anyone can take whenever they want. And I, his own wife, am nothing but an old hag to him who takes care of his children. He'd trade me for you if Ted would give him money or a TV. And then there's Ted. Ellie, he's in a lot of pain because of you, but right now I swear to you he's standing on one foot on a slippery fence. It won't take much for him to fall either way. You have to find him, never stop calling him and begging him to take you back. You know that Ted would do anything for you. Have him take you as far away from here and from us as possible. Ellie, Sally said slowly. I want you to realize something else. You know me, even after what you did and did to Billy. You know that I would never sleep with your man. I'm not that kind of woman. And deep down, ask yourself a question. How much does Ted love you? Do you really think he'd try to sleep with anyone but you? It's just so damn unlikely. So nothing happened with Ted today. In fact, we mostly talked about what it would take to get him to take you back. But if today is any indication of your life, I have to admit, I want it. You know how great today was? We went to the mall, he sat and watched while I tried on clothes, until we found the dress he wanted me in, then he bought the dress, the shoes. And it wasn't that he bought me clothes, that was special. It was the fact that he was interested in seeing me at my best and seeing me happy. And when people looked at me, I smiled because I knew they thought I had a man who treated me like I was special. You may take these things for granted, but most women don't. You just don't know how lucky you are. You don't know how lucky you are that he still loves you. And you risked it all to be used by Billy and a bunch of dumbass trailer park guys who probably don't even remember your name. Please tell me you're not that stupid. Don't become one of those desperate old ladies in that trailer park trying to entertain every jock that walks by. Don't get to the point of having a bunch of kids who don't even know who their fathers are. Don't end up alone, daydreaming about something you once had but never got around to. Honey, you don't know what you have until it's gone. And you're on the verge of losing what may be your only chance at a wonderful life. The only thing I can be proud of is that all my kids have the same daddy. And no matter how shitty Billy is, I know that in his own way, Billy loves me. And no matter how bad he is, he's not going to leave me. If you lose Ted, what will your life be like? I'm tired of preaching, honey, but I'll tell you one thing. If you and Ted were to break up for good, I'd go after him myself. Then I heard Billy's loud laugh. She can't go, he said. She's just another trailer park whore. I entertain her every morning as soon as you leave to take the kids to school. Today, while you were gone, she was with me and Tom and that cocky mailman. She'll never stop. The funny thing is, I really believe she loves old Ted but she just has an itch that takes more than one guy to fix. So she can be faithful to Ted when he's around. But when he's not, it's a different story. And Ted is one of those guys who just has to have a job and a bunch of crap. So he'll always be working until he can't work anymore. If she wasn't on the strongest birth control pills, there's no telling how many kids she'd have by now. Mine and Ted's and God knows who else's. So if you love her as much as you say you do, the best thing to do is just get on board and help her cover it up. That way, Ted can keep working for all of us. Then I heard Billy's laughter again and the sound of the trailer door opening and closing. Ellie, tell me what that asshole said isn't true, Sally said. You didn't have fun with him this morning, did you? Ellie was silent, then started crying again. I didn't think anyone would find out, she said. Ted hasn't touched me or approached me since the show. I couldn't help it. Please don't tell him. I sat down and sank even deeper into the thick, soft leather of the seat of my Mustang. Tears began to flow freely down my cheeks. I turned off the small receiver and disconnected it from the auxiliary input of my Mustang. By now you've probably guessed that the whole lunch date with Sally was a setup. Tiny bugs had been sewn into the lining of the dress and even the shoes I'd bought for Sally today. I hoped she'd do what I'd planned. Go home and talk to Ellie about what we did today. I hoped that Ellie would give me some clue as to how she felt about me and what she had done. I hoped I could make her a little jealous by buying clothes for her sister. The dress, bugs, and lunch cost a lot less than hiring a private investigator. 
but my grand plan had backfired, causing me far more pain than even Maury's show. I looked over at the woman sitting on the other bar stool to see her reaction. She was looking at me with her mouth open. I put the five on the bar stool and started to get up. The bowling alley should be open by now. Wait, you can't just leave. What did you do next? What are you doing now? You have to tell me how it ended, she pleaded. I sighed and sat back down. Well, um... Lisa, she added quickly. Lisa, every story doesn't have an ending. It's not a novel from the thrift store or a free story about it on the internet. Sometimes you just have to keep moving until the pain goes away, but I'll tell you what I did. I drove straight to the trailer park. It wasn't more than a mile away because those little bugs don't transmit any farther than that. I swung the trailer door open and as soon as Billy stood up, I held out my hand like I wanted to shake his. When he reached out, I punched him hard in the jaw. He went down. As he lay there, I kicked him hard in the balls and then again for good measure. Sally and Ellie were too shocked to do anything about it. I turned around and pulled a pipe out of my pocket. I walked over to the sink in the trailer and plugged the receiver into the cheap boom box they were using as a stereo. The sound of their own voices made them sit up and listen. The only distraction was the moans of Billy, who was still squirming on the floor with a bloodstain growing in his crotch. Sally, you're too good for this hole and these people. I know you won't want to, but I'm offering you a chance right now. You and your kids will come with me. We will never look back, I said. Sally shook her head silently. Ellie started to scream as I turned to leave. What about us? Ted, I love you. I'm going to leave with you. I'm going to change. Please don't leave me. Don't divorce me. We can work this out. We have to. I won't let any other woman near you, including my sister. Ellie, I said sadly. The worst part about it is that I still love you, even after everything I heard on that tape. But I also hate you for the way you treated me. Sally said it best. You don't know what you have until it's gone. But she said it to the wrong person. You knew what you had. You had a man who loved you, was faithful to you, and would do anything to make you happy. I say had because I left. And I'm never coming back. Sally talked to me. I didn't know what I had until it was gone. Because I thought I had a wife who loved me and only me. I thought I had a love that would last my whole life. But that wasn't what I had, was it? And I didn't know that until even an iota of that love was gone, burned away in an instant by what I heard on that tape. I won't tell you what I had, what you are, because I'm too damn sweet to even say it. But you're gone forever. I mean it. Even if I'm angry and hurt now, and then I realize I still love you, it won't matter because I'll never be able to trust you. And without trust, we can't have a marriage. But don't worry about the divorce. I called my lawyer on the way here and asked him to cancel the divorce. I heard them both breathe a sigh of relief. They heard that I had decided not to divorce her. Then I smiled as coldly as I could and spoke again. You don't deserve a divorce? I'm going to do it trailer park style, just leave and start over somewhere else. Sooner or later I'll meet another woman and fall in love again. But I won't marry her. You made me lose faith in women. Besides, it's better this way. In a divorce, you'd have rights, a settlement, alimony, property division. If I just walk away, you don't get a damn thing. You don't even get the house because it's in my name. All you'll get is the sight of me walking away from your stupid ass. That's it. And I just walked out of the trailer, got in my Mustang, and drove off. Sally immediately started trying to call me. She told me that she thought Allie was as addicted to it as Billy was, and maybe they could put her in treatment. I told her not to worry because I'm just not interested in a wife who needs to be taught how not to have fun with me, or one that needs to be taught how to keep her legs closed. Over the next few days, Ellie stood me up at work and even found my house. It got to the point where I told my lawyer to write a restraining order. Ellie ignored him. In one awkward moment, she grabbed my leg as the police officers tried to pull her away from me. I realized that the only way to truly separate myself from her was to move out of state. So I quit my job and began the process of establishing a new life. Before leaving town, there were a few things I needed to do. I know I should have been above such petty things, but I couldn't help myself. The next morning, I visited the local post office with my attorney. I played the tape to the postmaster, and he turned pale when we mentioned the alienation of affection suit and a possible post office department lawsuit. We knew we couldn't sue the post office because it is a branch of the federal government, but apparently small-town postmasters don't see it that way because he called the postal operator 
whose name was Ed, and immediately fired him. He also offered me a five-figure sum to avoid taking the matter to court. He said he realized it wasn't much, but it would help me feather my nest, so I accepted. As I left the post office, I found Ed crying by his locker. I gave him a light pat on the shoulder. While he was squirming on the floor, I picked up his wallet and went over to his apartment to deliver the tape to his grumpy wife. She asked for a copy, so I'm sure divorce was in Ed's future. That left only Tom for my petty revenge. Tom prided himself on having the best trailer in the park. He was one of the few in the park who owned his own trailer, and it actually had wheels. When I pulled into the park without a lawyer, Tom was sitting in front of the trailer where Marilyn and her parents lived. I drove by and went up the hill to Tom's trailer. Once there, I pulled a trailer roller out of the trunk and attached it to Tom's hitch. Most trailers roll fine, but the trailer hitch and the posts and tiny wheels attached to it make them awkward to move unless they are towed. I quickly attached the roller and went around Tom's trailer, removing any bricks, wedges, or pieces of wood that might interfere with the easy movement of the trailer. What happened next was simple, just pushing the trailer to get it to start rolling down the slope, and gravity helped a lot. Tom's trailer was heading toward the lake. Once it started moving, it would be hard to stop it, especially since Tom would have to climb the hill and then run down the other side to keep his house out of the lake. When the trailer started rolling down the hill, Everyone didn't notice it until a minute or two later, and when they did, they thought it was the funniest thing ever. I got the impression that not many of them liked Tom. After the trailer plunged into the lake, everyone gathered around to watch it sink. Tom came running in, out of breath from running. He was swearing and ready to be tied up. Relax, Tom, someone said. Your insurance will take care of it. Tom didn't have any insurance. Someone else fired up the grill, and they all grilled hot dogs and watched Tom's trailer sink. I guess some people will do anything for entertainment. I pulled Tom away from the scene and he came with me. He probably didn't know that I knew about him having fun with Ellie. That's for Ellie, I said, and stroked Tom's belly, causing him to fall to the floor. After I let out my emotions, there was nothing else left in this town for me. So I set off in search of greener pastures. Before I left town, I liquidated all my assets, including quickly selling both houses and everything else we had accumulated during our marriage. Anything I couldn't sell, I burned. I know that to all you legal experts out there, what I did was damn near illegal, but I didn't care, and I still don't. I didn't leave Ellie a damn dime. I even burned all her clothes. I left Sally a few thousand dollars for emergencies with her or her kids and an anonymous email address where she could contact me from time to time, but I left town and never looked back. I don't stay in one place long enough for her to track me down. Thanks to selling houses and my assets, I have a fair amount of wealth. When I move to a city or town, I easily find a job as an engineer. If not, I move. I rolled my retirement account into a self-directed IRA so I can still pay into it. Someday I'll settle down and find someone, but probably not until my heart stops hurting for Ellie. Every now and then I hear from Sally, and at the mention of Allie, my heart starts to ache again. Right now, Billy is completely devoted to Sally. He has no choice. He suffers from erectile dysfunction thanks to my lucky kicks. He still doesn't have a job. Ally, according to Sally, still loves me and wants me back. She came on Maury's show again, claiming she was pregnant and needed to find the father of her child. She wasn't actually pregnant. She just wanted the show to use its resources to try and track me down. She doesn't want money or anything like that. She supposedly just wants me back. I fly far under the radar because these TV shows have a lot of resources, including a private investigator, and I don't want them to find me and give her any information about my whereabouts. Sometimes I stay with a woman for a few nights or more, but I still haven't found anyone to take Ellie's place in my heart. I'll probably love that skinny trailer park whore until the day I die, but I can't live with her or be around her. So for now it's just me and my Mustang watching the US one city at a time. Even now, a year later, Every time I see some skinny, red-headed girl, a tear rolls down my cheek, and I realize I still haven't forgotten her. I'm sure she's already made her way through the trailer park in half the town. I know this isn't the ending you wanted or expected. In fact, it's not really an ending at all. If you want a better ending, I'll let you write it. Lisa threw her head back and finished her beer. She was a pretty woman with long, dark hair and crystal clear blue eyes. You're definitely not what I expected, she said. But you'll do. She reached into her purse and pulled out her cell phone, gun, and badge license from there. As she dialed a number on her cell phone, I looked at the badge. 
She wasn't a cop. She was a licensed private investigator. Yes, this is Lisa, she said into the phone. That was another dead end. There isn't one in this town either. There was a guy here who drove a Mustang, but it's the wrong color and the wrong year, and the guy's too old to be one. I'll tell you something else, Marty. I'm tired of this. I don't want to spend the rest of my life tracking down other people's spouses. I think it's time for me to find my own, so I'm leaving. Tell the redhead and the people on the show that I don't think this guy's ever going to show up. She's wasting Maury's money and her life looking for him. Lisa stepped away from the bar, leaving her gun, badge, and phone in place. So, let's take a look at this Mustang, she said. I nodded and smiled at her as we headed for the door. Six weeks later, I realized I was in trouble. Since Lisa and I had left the bar, I hadn't thought of Ellie once. I told Lisa about it one morning when she got out of the shower and headed toward me. She just smiled and said, Maybe the reason you don't have the ending to the Ellie story is because you missed it. The end of the Ted and Ellie story came when you left the Maury show, your marriage was over, and everything else was just an epilogue. You weren't looking for the end of Ted and Ellie for a long time. You were looking for the beginning of Ted and Lisa's story. This is the story of you and me and our family, and it will last for the rest of our lives. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, so subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.